Hi, my name is Mark Liebman. I'm a retired Navy captain and naval aviator, and for most of my Navy career, I flew helicopters. I've got time in small helicopters like the Jet Ranger or the TH-57 in Navy parlance that weigh a couple thousand pounds to much larger H-3 Sea Kings, which would take off the way close to 20,000 pounds. And in this fit presentation, I'm gonna talk about helicopters, how they fly, how you control them in the cockpit, and why, in many ways, they're more dangerous than traditional fixed wing aircraft. So we're gonna start with a little history. I wanna start with the auto gyro, because the auto gyro, gyro looks like a helicopter, but it's really not. The first ones were flown in 1918, and essentially what it was is an airplane, as it moved through the air, the rotors began to turn and generate lift, and voila, you could fly. You could also fly relatively slowly, but you could not hover because the auto gyro needs forward airspeed to be able to control it, which is, and its controls are, are traditional airplane controls, rudders, elevators, and ailerons. The first practical helicopter, or the first helicopter that we know today was built by Focke Wulf in 1936. This is in the days of Nazi Germany, and they actually built two of them. But again, as you can see in this picture, you have rotors on each side, and they were there to, they were positioned there to counter, counteract torque. The way this helicopter was controlled was through the rudder at the back and an elevator. So it really wasn't a helicopter as we know it today, and they only built two of them. A Russian immigrant by the name of Igor Sikorsky came to the United States in, uh, after World War I, and he was known for building flying boats, but he wanted to build a true helicopter. And he's the man who finally figured out how to control torque, how to control the blades, and create a functional helicopter. And his mantra was this. He stated quite often that an airplane can fly over, a, fly over you and drop flowers, but a helicopter can come down and, and save your life. And so this is what he was trying to do, is build an airplane or a machine that could land and hover and pick people up who are in extremis. So what you see in this picture is the first helicopter with an articulating rotor head. What that means is the blades lead and lag. They twist and turn, and you can control them with the, the controls in a helicopter. And then he also came up with the idea of putting a tail rudder on to counteract torque. So the first helicopter was the VS-300. It was um, built in the 1943. The first ones were deployed in 1944, and the U.S. Coast Guard actually made the first rescue in Long Island Sound with one of the prototypes. In the late 40s, three new helicopter designs came out. One was the H-13, which was built by Bell, it, which at the time was a fixed-wing airplane manufacturer, and it was made famous in the movie MASH, but it was used extensively in Korea, primarily for medical evacuation of wounded soldiers. The Navy uh, came up with the H-5, built by Sikorsky, and if you ever saw the movie, The Bridges of Toko Ri, this is the helicopter that Mickey Rooney flew. And then the Marines were started flying this thing called an H-19, which was bigger than the H-5, bigger than the H-13, and theoretically could carry nine passengers. But the real growth in the helicopter what, that we know today came when the turbine engine was installed on the helicopter. The turbine engine is essentially a jet connected to, a jet engine connected to a transmission, and the transmission drives the rotor, head, the rotor blades and the tail rotor. So the turbine engine is much lighter. The, the T-58 in the H-3 weighs all of 190 pounds, and it generates 12 to 1,500 horsepower depending on the model, whereas a piston engine weighs 1,500, 1,600 pounds, and you're lucky to get uh, 1,000 horsepower. So what this enabled you to do is build a helicopter that was bigger, could carry more, and was, in helicopter terms, faster. And so when I talk about helicopter speeds, we're not talking about jets that are smoking along at 480 knots. We're talking about a helicopter that's going really fast if it's going 120 knots. There are six types of helicopter configurations. There's a single rotor. There's what they call the intermeshing rotor where the two blades go like this and they hopefully stay in synchronization so they don't hit each other. Then there's the helicopters or tandem rotors, which you got one in the front and one in the back. And again, the blades are synchronized. You have a coaxial rotor, which um, has one blade, set of blades on top of the other. And then, of course, we have tilt wing, which is what Bell made famous. It's made here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. That's which the wing actually tilts with the rotors or the rotors and engines actually tilt themselves. And then you have what's called a compound helicopter, which is a combination of repeller dro uh, propellers and and uh, rotor blades. The thing I like to point out to all my fixed wing friends is the first flying machine in outer space 
that didn't use rocket power was in fact a helicopter. We all saw that in 2021 uh, when in, uh, in Infinity made it, or Ingenuity, excuse me, made its flight on, on the planet Mars. So let's talk about the anatomy of a helicopter and what the dynamic components are. And I'm gonna use a single rotor helicopter. This in the picture happens to be an H60. And so starting in the aft end, you can see the tail rotor and it's attached to a tail rotor gearbox. Going down the tail pylon, there's an intermediate gearbox which allows the drive shaft that drives the tail rotor to change directions. And that goes all the way up forward to the uh, main transmission which drives the main rotor blades and the two engines which are connected to the transmission which drive the main rotor blades. So from a dynamic perspective, that's what we're gonna be talking about from this point on. The other kinds of helicopters, compound, coaxial, uh, tandem, all have similar components. So airplanes move forward because their wings generate lift. Essentially, the wing moving through the air has um, a low pressure area on the top, a high pressure area underneath, and voila, you get lift and the airplane takes off. Well, helicopters are a little bit different. By spinning the rotors, we, which in themselves are airfoils, the helicopter generates lift. Okay, so what you have to do is you have to generate enough lift by the rotors so that the helicopter can actually fly. However, when you do that, you create torque. Okay, and the torque has to be compensated one of two ways, or one of three ways. One is through a tail rotor, another is by using a a tandem helicopter with uh, rotor blades going in opposite directions at the front and the back, and then the coaxial, which is the, the rotor blades that are stacked on top of each other. So when you look in a helicopter cockpit, it sort of looks like a fixed wing airplane because it's got a stick and a rudder puddles, but it also has a strange thing on the left called a collective. So the collective sits right here on the left-hand side of the cockpit, and what it does and where it gets its name is it controls the pitch of all the rotor blades at the same time. So if you pull up on the collective, the rotor blades coming forward will increase in pitch. The rotor blades on the, the, the retreating side will actually decrease slightly, but you're basically creating the helicopter's gonna go up. And oh, by the way, in modern helicopters, it's also connected to the engine, so you're also controlling the power. So it's a combination of changing the pitch of all the rotor blades, and uh, it's like a throttle. So between your legs is a thing called a stick. Well, in the helicopter, it's known as a cyclic stick. And what it does as you move it left and right, it actually causes the rotor blades to change their position. And since it's attached rigidly to the fuselage, the, when, the, rotor, when the, the blades tilt like this, the helicopter goes sideways. Or if you push it forward, push the cyclic stick forward, the blades tilt this way and the helicopter goes forward. Conversely, if you pull aft on the cyclic, the helicopter is gonna go aft. In front of you, down by your feet, are two rudder pedals, and they act just like the rudders in an airplane. You push on the right one, the nose will turn to the right. You turn on the left one, it'll turn to the nose, the airplane will rotate to the left. Because what you're doing is you're changing the pitch of the tail rotor blades, and you're either increasing the amount of uh, lift that they're generating to offset the torque, or they're decreasing it. And so the exciting thing about a helicopter is if you move one control, you're gonna to have to move the other two in concert. So what I tell people, if you can pat your head, pat your stomach, and move them in different opposite directions at the same time while you move your feet like this, you can fly a helicopter, maybe. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how the helicopter actually flies. So since you understand the controls on a cockpit, what happens is what you're really doing is you're tilting the rotor disc, or and when you're tilting the rotor disc, the fuselage of the helicopter, which is rigidly attached to it through the rotor mass. So as the rotor disc goes like that, the helicopter will go forward. Rotor disc tilts to the left or tilts to the right, and the helicopter will actually go sideways unless you add a little bit of rudder, and it sort of goes around, around in a turn. It's coordinated flight because you have a needle and ball, but it also is a little different than a fixed wing airplane. The other thing that's unusual about a helicopter is if you put it in a position, you have to hold it there. Now there are trim systems that do that, but unlike a fixed wing airplane, it doesn't continue on. It basically goes where you move the controls to. So, for example, if you want to fly sideways at, at a, in a hover, um, you're in a hover, what you do is you move the cyclic slightly to the left to add a little bit of power, and you have to add a little bit of right rudder, excuse me, left rudder in an American helicopter, right rudder in a French helicopter to compensate for the additional torque. You want to stop, 
you basically, you basically move the cyclic back to the mi middle, lower the collective, and, and then move your feet as accordingly to compensate for the change in torque. So if you think the controls are complicated, this is the cockpit of a CH-47. Now granted, this is an early cockpit. When I say early, early before the days of all glass cockpits. So you can see you have, in this thing in the center stack, you can see all the engine instruments, but in addition to engine and flight instruments that are common to fixed wing airplanes, we also have things like torque meters for the, uh, how, much engine, how much torque the engines are generating. We have um, transmission oil pressure and oil temperature gauges. We have rotor RPM gauges and all that kind of good stuff, which fixed wing airplanes don't have. And all the radios and all the other good stuff is pretty common. But when you move on to a more modern helicopter cockpit, yes, it's all glass. As you can see, this is a uh, got five panels in it, but all those controls and all those dials that you saw in the H-47 cockpit still exist and they're still in the cockpit. You still need to know the, the transmission torques, rotor RPM, um, oil pressure for the transmissions, and all that kind of good stuff. So let's talk about why helicopters are difficult and dangerous to fly. The first topic is density altitude, and I call this the insidious killer. The reason being is that most people don't realize as the temperature rises, the air changes in density, and it's called density altitude. So altitude compensated for air, temp air temperature is called density altitude. Essentially, for every 1,000 feet of density altitude, you lose 3.5% of your power, engine power, and the amount of lift that the rotors will generate. And while this doesn't sound like a whole lot, if you're in Dallas, Texas, for example, where it's 90 degrees a lot, 120 odd days a year or, uh, or more, um, you're suddenly the helicopter is sitting on the ground at 560 feet or 760 feet, depending on the airport, the helicopter is actually at 2,000 feet and you've lost 7% of your power and lift. At 100 degrees in that same situation, the helicopter is suddenly at 3,000 feet. And the reason being this is because helicopters, as they, they fly higher and higher, lose, uh, well, so much they, they lose lift or there's less lift, but they're also less efficient. So when you get to 10,000 feet and you're flying in mountains in a helicopter, the controls are really sloppy. And in many cases, if you lower the collective, you're going down because you don't have enough power to continue to climb. So altitude, particularly density altitude, even flying around towns at a sea level like Houston uh, and Dallas, is a very important factor to consider. Another one is a, uh, a situation called settling with power. And what this is, is you're in a hover, and the more power you add, add the faster the helicopter is descending. What's happening is that the ground cushion underneath you has been disturbed, and what's happening is the, the whatever lift you're generating from the, from the rotor blades is gone, and the helicopter literally just settles. So what happened, what you as a pilot have to do in this condition, once you recognize it, is you have to reduce the amount of power, lower the nose, and try to fly out of the situation. But the problem is you're generally at low altitude, and so you can't dive out, and so essentially what you gotta do is um, reduce the amount of power and just land. Now, if you remember the raid on, that killed Osama bin Laden, the H-60 wound up in the courtyard, and that's what happened to him. The, he was hovering over the courtyard, it was actually over the wall. The wall was disturbing the, um, the, the ground cushion and the airflow into the helicopter. He got into a condition called settling with power and the rest is history. So here's another exciting one called retreating blade stall. Some people call it advancing blade stall. Some people call it retreating blade stall. The cause is always the same. The helicopter is going too fast for its actual weight. So what happens is the blades actually stall. Okay, and when they stall, they stall very abruptly. And normally what happens is the helicopter rolls on its back. And if you're unlucky, a rotor blade comes off. If, you're, if it just falls on its back and you've got some altitude, hopefully you can get it out of that position because helicopters do not fly well when they're upside down. You either have to get past the, the inverted position, either rolling or getting the nose out. So advancing blade stall or retreating blade stall is a bad thing. What can you do about it to prevent it? when you feel it, the onset, which is generally severe vibrations, and there's not a lot of warning, so once you get into the vibrations, the simple thing is just raise the nose, lower the collective, and slow up. So let's talk about auto rotations. A lot of people think, and the common perception is, oh, when you get in trouble with the helicopter, you just lower the collective and you land, you auto rotate down. Well, it's not that simple. Since most helicopters are flying generally about 1,000 feet or less above the ground, we're pretty close to the ground. 
And the other thing is that when you're in an auto rotation, the helicopter is coming down, depending on its type and, the, and its weight and a few other conditions, you could be coming down at two to 4,000 or uh, feet per minute or more. So let's just use, you're flying at 1,000 feet and the helicopter comes down at 4,000 feet per minute in an auto rotation. That means you have 15 seconds to do the following. One, bottom the collective. So you put the collective on the, on the stop at the bottom. Lower the nose or adjust the nose to get the most efficient auto rotation airspeed. Typically it's somewhere between 70 and 90 knots. Now you're coming down. Then when you get to about 100 to 200, 150 feet above the ground, you begin to raise the nose. So as the nose comes up, the rotor RPM begins to increase. Then you rock the helicopter forward, hopefully just adding a little bit of collective because you don't, because just the energy in the rotor blades is all you got because the engine's not developing power. And somewhere around 15 to 20 feet, you pull enough up to stop the rate of descent and you touch down at something around three to five knots. It takes me longer to describe this than actually happens. So it's bottom of the collective, get to airspeed, flare, touch down. It's that fast, and a lot of guys get it wrong. This is why you see a lot of helicopter, helicopters that roll themselves up in a ball when they try to auto-rotate. You don't have much time, and you only have the energy that's in the rotors to cushion the landing. So once that's gone, you're essentially a stone. The next one I want to talk about is the loss of tail rotor authority, and that can come from a variety of things. It could come from a gearbox failure, either the tail or the intermediate, gearbox and cause uh, caused by a the drive shaft to fail either bearing se uh, seizes and the thing doesn't turn or it spins and breaks um, you can lose a tail rotor blade which generally is somewhat catastrophic I'll talk about that in a second or you can lose the loss of control of the pitch of the tail rotor blades so let's assume that the helicopter doesn't come apart when one of these things happens so what do you do well actually you don't have to auto rotate what you the helicopter will yaw uh, dramatically to one to the left or right, depending on whether it's a French or American helicopter. And so you wind up flying the helicopter at a reduced airspeed, somewhere around 70 to 90 knots, at about a 30 degree yaw, and you just kind of go, go that way. If it's a, um, if you lose control of the tail rotor, you basically have whatever control was at that point, or you have no control at all. If you lose a blade, that generally causes all kinds of vibrations, and generally a tail pylon comes off, and that's generally catastrophic. Uh, but if, if it's a uh, gearbox, tail rotor gearbox, or drive shaft failure, again, you can control the helicopter, and what you do is a running landing. You load the landing gear if you've got wheels, and you put it down on a, on a runway or on a road, someplace that can let it roll out. If you've got skids, you just have to slow it up, understanding that as you slow up, you're increasing power, and means the nose is going to yaw one side or the other, and you have to compensate for that. But the loss of a tail rotor uh, authority or control is not as dangerous as it might seem. What is dangerous if you lose the blade, which causes vibrations, and then could cause the tail pylon to come off, and that generally is catastrophic. The last one I, talk, I want to talk about is something called dead man's curve. Um, it's officially known as the height velocity diagram, and you can see in this chart there's a red area, and every helicopter manufacturer that I know, and I've seen manuals from Eurocopter, Aerospatiale, Sikorsky, Bell, uh, Boeing Virtual all have a version of this. Essentially the red area is an area that says stay out unless absolutely necessary. Now why? Well because it's called hovering out of ground effect if you're on the, the side uh, to the left and up because what that means is if you're hovering at 100 feet above the ground at 10 knots and you're moving through the air at 10 knots, you are hovering out of ground effect and the only thing that's keeping you in the air is the power being delivered to the rotor blades and if you get to a situation where they don't generate enough lift, i.e. a density altitude situation, or you're going too slow, or uh, you have a gust of wind that, takes, that screws up your lift, then you have a problem. And the only way out is to lower the nose and dive out. So if you are, let's say, in Kauai and you're in a helicopter flying up Waimea Canyon and you're hovering 300 feet above the canyon floor so that your passengers can get a nice look at the vegetation on the on the sides of the canyon and you have a problem mechanical wind whatever you're going to crash because you have no way out because in front of you is this god awful cliff so the other place this really comes into effect is on rooftop heliport heliports so in the Dallas area 
Uh, we have rooftop hillock ports all over the place. New York City does as well, and most metropolitan areas. The problem is, in hot and high conditions, the helicopter may not have enough power to land safely on the hill, hill pad because you've got to slow up, and for the last minute, minute and a half of the flight, you are well into the dead man's curve. And again, any mechanical problem causes will generally cause an accident. So now hopefully you know more about how helicopters fly, how they're controlled, and some of the risks you have either flying or riding in a helicopter. So if you want more information on my website, which is www.markliebman.com, there are two places where you can go to get more information. One is called From the Hack Seat, and that's mostly about flying helicopters in the Navy. And then there's the other one called Fun and Dumb Things, and it's about fun and dumb things I've done in flying machines, both helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft. There's also more information on me, more information about the 11 books that I've written, nine of which have a helicopter pilot as the hero. There's two about the American Revolution, which obviously didn't have um, helicopters back then. And I hope you visit that. And also, most importantly, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you and have a great day.